Every high school student knows it. There is often fierce tension between the in crowd and those kids who seem to be different. Tonight we're going to revisit a small city where the tensions finally exploded one wintry night. Two high school groups known as the Jocks and the Punks clashed. And as I told you before, the tragic confrontation would end up dividing the entire community. Isolated by miles of empty prairie, Amarillo is a lone outpost on the Texas Panhandle, a place where the stark landscape stretches to the horizon and the cowboy life isn't forgotten. Focus, focus, on many Friday nights in Amarillo, high school football reigns supreme. The game is worshipped and the players revered. But across town, there is a very different group of teens. They have rebelled against the football culture and created one of their own. They call themselves punks. They sport mohawks, tattoos, and body piercing. The worlds of the punks and the jocks would collide one cold December night, and in one horrible moment, one teenager would be dead, and the other changed forever. 17-year-old Dustin Camp played on the high school football team. By all accounts, he was the all-American kid with above-average grades. Brian Denicky was different. He was a high school dropout who had minor scuffles with the law. He wore a green mohawk and a spiked collar. His parents were initially mortified by his appearance, but they say underneath the strange garb and rebellious lifestyle, Brian was a good kid. Brian's brother, Jason, agrees. And he was always smiling. He was always trying to make people laugh. Somebody was in a bad mood or upset, he'd be trying to cheer him up. Things like that. But not everyone in conservative Amarillo could see past the leather and chains. Brian's father says Brian paid a price for being different. Groups of kids, you know, jump them, beat them up. I mean, all his friends had a nickname for him. They'd call him, uh, refer to him as a fist magnet. Why was it so important to subject himself to that kind of physical abuse? Stubbornness, independent spirit. He, he felt like he had a right. I sat down with a group of Brian's friends, and I must admit, their look was initially distracting. They told me stories of how the jocks taunted them in the halls of the high school and on the streets. Fags and freaks is one of the biggest words that they know. Every night I would have people try to start fights with me. How many of you guys have been attacked physically? Raise your hand. The punks say it was this kind of name-calling and taunting that led to a minor scuffle with the jocks one Saturday night at the IHOP restaurant, the punks regular hangout. For the next seven days, tension between the two groups escalated and rumors spread at the high school. The jocks and the punks would have it out the following weekend. On the evening of December 12th, the IHOP parking lot was packed with teenagers. Among them was Dustin Camp in his 1983 Cadillac. In the back seat was Elise Thompson. When we drove up, there were a lot of people standing around in the parking lot, and I didn't see any punks there. Minutes later, Jason Denicky showed up with his brother Brian, and what happened next depends on which side you believe. Jason said the jocks picked a fight. I just walked up to the door. Next thing we, we heard was basically we heard faggot and freak, which is their choice word and uh, turned around and basically we were surrounded. The punks numbered five boys and four girls. Eyewitnesses estimate the number of jocks at anywhere between 20 and 50. When you guys went to IHOP that night, were you carrying any weapons? I always carried pepper spray. Was Brian carrying anything? He always carried a chain with a lock on the end. So you weren't going to IHOP armed with weapons, spoiling for a fight. You normally carry chains and police batons and mace. You have to. <laughs> because... We always get jumped. Mark Kelly, the IHOP manager that night, heard commotion in the parking lot. Uh, the punks were by the door. The jocks kind of had a half circle simmered around them, telling them, you know, won't you guys come fight, you know, come fight. The arguments grew more heated, so Kelly ordered everyone off the parking lot. But it didn't end there. The jocks and the punks moved across the street. Dustin Camp, along with his friend Rob Mansfield and Elise Thompson, followed the crowd in Dustin's car. All these guys go ahead and go across the street. And the next thing I know, Brian takes off, so I'm not going to let him go by himself. 
911, what's your emergency? Yes, I'm at the uh, IHOP in Western, and there's going to be a major fight across the street. Within seconds, the fists began to fly. The jocks and the punks have very different accounts of what happened next. Jackie Balderas says she saw the jocks go after Brian. There's like 15, 10, 15 people around him just kicking him and hitting him and beating him up. And he was just like in the fetal position on the ground. But Elise Thompson remembers it was the punks who were beating a football player. We looked over and he was down on the ground with um, about four or five guys around him, some of whom had weapons. As the two sides fought, Dustin Camp weaved his car through the crowd, first swiping punker Chris Olds. It just seemed like he was trying to drive towards people, basically just trying to hit people. After he hit the first guy, Rob started yelling, let's go, let's get out of here. Dustin started to kind of make his way towards the exit. But Dustin Camp did not leave the parking lot. Instead, he made a fateful decision. He spun his car around and drove straight for Brian Denneke. And then the car hit him, and he came up on the hood and then rolled underneath. And, um, you know, I, I felt two bumps, and I was just praying that um, the bumps had been the median and not his body. Jason Denneke began running toward his brother. It was just a lot of blood. He was just coughing up blood. As Jason Denneke cradled his dying brother in his arms, Dustin Camp left the parking lot and drove away. He turned onto the interstate to head home, and Elisa's stunned silence turned into dread. I leaned up in between um, the two boys, and, and I said, what if he's dead? And um, you know, no one said anything. Did you think that Brian Denneke was dead? I knew in my heart that he was. Brian Denneke was dead, but it was how his killer was treated afterward that stunned the dead boy's grieving family. Okay, when happened? we come back, aftermath in Amarillo. It looked like an open and shut case. There were no skid marks and damning eyewitness testimony. But would Dustin Camp be asked to pay for what he had done? Right after he hit Brian, he said, I'm a ninja in my caddy. I bet he liked that one. We return now to a small city in Texas where a dangerous divide had opened up between two rival teenage groups. Things heated up in a parking lot outside a local hangout, and a high school athlete named Dustin Camp made a deadly decision. Instead of leaving the area, he turned his Cadillac around and aimed it straight at his rival, Brian Denneke. 911, what's your emergency? We need an ambulance. Okay, what Somebody happened? been injured. In an Amarillo parking lot, a teenager lay dead. The aftermath of a fight between the jocks and the punks. Brian Denneke's mother, Betty, was home decorating the Christmas tree when the telephone rang. Her son, Jason, told her to come to the shopping center. And I says, where's Brian? And then I saw the blanket and him laying on the ground. And then the police officer told me that he was gone. Brian Denneke's skull and chest had been crushed by the two-ton Cadillac, his collarbone torn from his shoulder. What for you was the most difficult of those details to learn? To find out and to realize and to know that somebody took a car and deliberately ran down your son. Dustin Camp had gone home. He parked his car in his parents' driveway and went to bed. When the police showed up at 6 o'clock the next morning, they found damage to the hood of the Cadillac, blood splattered underneath, and an empty bottle of Crown Royal whiskey inside. Dustin Camp was arrested and charged with murder. In his statement to police, Camp said it was an accident. I saw a guy swinging a bat at one of my friends. I was just going to knock him down with my car. It was icy on the ground. My car slid, and I guess he slipped, and my car went over him. No, no, it, it was not an accident. 
Sergeant Rudy Montano, the chief investigator on the case, says Camp's statement contradicted eyewitness accounts. There's just too many witnesses to say this was an accident. It was a deliberate act. Prosecutor John Quayle thought he had an open and shut case proving Dustin Camp had intentionally murdered Brian Denneke. He told the jury that Dustin Camp had never turned the wheel to avoid hitting Brian, that he fled the scene and lied to police. But the prosecutor's most damning evidence was what Elise Thompson heard Dustin say that night. Right after he hit Brian, he said um, something very offhand, like, I'm a ninja in my caddy. Something. I'm a ninja in my caddy. And he said, um, I bet he liked that one. I think they're the utterings of a 17-year-old in a grip of panic and fear. Warren Clark is Dustin Camp's attorney. Dustin Camp and his parents refused to speak with us on camera. In that statement to police the next morning, he said that I slipped on some ice. The car slipped on some ice, and Brian probably slipped on some ice and made it sound like it was accidental. It was, was a lie. lie. Well, people, people lie in these situations all the time. I find it not to be unusual in my line of business that people will lie. In court, Clark dismissed Dustin's lies and instead launched a bold counterattack, putting Brian Dennecke and his lifestyle on trial. He called the punks goons and armed thugs. He said Brian had been drinking and was the aggressor that night. On that night of December 12th, he was a mean drunk, and he was and he was armed, and he was beating on people. Clark showed the jury what Brian Dennecke was wearing that night, combat boots, camouflaged pants, and chains, painting the picture of an aggressive youth. Anybody that knew Brian knew that that wasn't true. They believed in defending themselves if they had to, but they didn't believe in going out and seeking fights, picking on people. Clark argued Dustin Camp acted bravely and returned to the scene to save the life of his friend, who he said Brian Dennecke was beating. Clark said Camp was merely acting in what he called self-defense of a third person. When you argue self-defense, you argue that the act was intentionally done, but that the murder is excusable because it was self-defense. You said Dustin had to take immediate action, and he took it. And if he had to live it over again, he would do it again. Yeah. Did you really mean that? Yeah, I did mean that. But that statement of yours implies that if he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't slow down. He wouldn't hit the brakes. He could have driven away and left his friends in the lurch, but he chose to come back. It was out of loyalty. It may have been misdirected loyalty, but it was out of loyalty to his friends. Brian Dennecke's friends remember it differently. What was Brian doing at the moment that Dustin Camp hit him with the car? Running. Running? He was running from the car. He was running away from the car. He wasn't fighting somebody? He was by himself. Which of the two sides would the Amarillo jury believe? After hearing the evidence, jurors took just three hours to decide. They convicted Dustin Camp not of murder, but of the lesser crime of manslaughter. And it was what these 12 jurors would do next that would shock the city. Camp's punishment for killing a punker would only be probation. <coughs> Dustin Camp has been sentenced to probation for the murder of your son. He won't spend a night in jail. He didn't spend he never a night. Did. I, don't know if, I don't know if he even spent an hour in jail, period. It's a joke, a slap on the wrist. You're still out with your family, still going to sleep in your bed at night. Do you think if the tables had been turned and it was Brian Dennecke who ran down and killed Dustin that night, that Brian Dennecke would have gone to prison? I think with Mr. Dennecke's past, it would have been a harder job of keeping him out of prison. Plus, let's face it, appearance means something. Does it? The way, yes, it means something in Amarillo, Texas, and it means something in New York City. Sometimes the conclusions we reach on appearance are improper and not justified. But in a murder case, they're pretty important. Since the trial, many punks say the way they look is still an issue. Some say they continue to be harassed and are considering leaving Amarillo. 
As for Dustin Camp, he graduated last spring, and many punks say they remember the reaction of some of his fellow students as Camp received his diploma. Walked up there just strutting on that stage, got his diploma, walked down the aisle, and people cheered for him. The whole, half the high school is cheering for this miserable son of a bitch. Brian Denicky's parents have never spoken to Dustin Camp. They continue to live their lives in quiet devastation. They have just spent their third Christmas without their son. What would you like Dustin Camp to know about Brian or about the pain he has caused you? I wonder if he, I sometimes wonder if he even accepts the fact that he, he did take out a life. He, he killed someone who um, could have potentially contributed a lot to society. There is still plenty of soul searching going on in Amarillo. A memorial service was held in December on the very spot where Brian was killed. And many residents hope that the teenagers here were paying attention to this tragic lesson. Harsh words and unwise choices can lead to tragedy. We're all a little more alike than, than we like to think, you know, that you can't hate someone and you can't even fight someone just because they look differently than you. The Denicky family recently settled a wrongful death suit for $20,000, the amount the Camp family's insurance policy would cover. As for Dustin Camp, he is just finishing his freshman year at West Texas A&M.